All right, today we have Andy Berner of QSM, and he's going to be talking to us today about his session titled Grooming the Backlog, Plan the Work, Work the Plan. So to start things off, thank you for joining us, and can you tell us about um, a little bit about yourself and your role at the company? Sure. Thanks, Cameron. I've, I've been with QSM a little over two years after many years with IBM Rational and uh, several other companies before that. <laughs> I guess I've been in this industry uh, more years than maybe I care to admit. Um, but QSM is a company that provides some consulting and tools for software estimation and project control. And I'm on the development team for those tools, but I'm also focused on making sure that our tools keep up to fit new methodologies such as Agile. QSM's been in business over 30 years, and we've seen probably every methodology that exists. And we try to make sure that our tools stay ad adaptable and, and up to date so that they can be used with modern methods. So I try to make sure that customers can tailor our tools to fit their Agile environments. I'm also involved with integrations uh, between our tools and other tools throughout the software lifecycle. Okay. Um, so what led you to the idea of your session? Um, we've done a lot of research at QSM. We've been doing more and more research on the factors that make Agile projects successful. And one key factor that we found is making sure that there's enough time and effort spent on getting the requirements right. Agile coaches recognize and even emphasize this importance of grooming the backlog, but we've seen that there's less information available on what that work actually entails and how you plan and make sure that you have the resources that you need to do it. So we thought it would be valuable to, at the conference to say more than uh, you ought to just do it and really help folks anticipate the resources and the effort that they'll need to put in and be able to set the expectations on what's going to be needed to keep that backlog groomed. Okay, so your session kind of covers some best practices and you know how to really just be super successful at uh, you know grooming the backlog. But really, why is it important uh, to groom the backlog? It, it's it's incredibly important. Agile coders can really only stay as productive as they can as as the requirements that they're given. So they have to be have they have to have well thought out requirements at the start of each iteration. Vague requirements and requirements churn are just as much a hindrance in Agile projects as they are in any other kind of software development. And it's especially difficult in Agile because we get going right away. You, need a, you always need a steady flow of groomed requirements. We don't have the luxury that you might have in some other methods of a big upfront requirements phase to get everything straightened out in advance, which of course causes an inevitable delay in, in the development. But at least you, can, you, you have a chance to get some of that churn removed before the developers um, even see it. In Agile, you have to keep at it iteration by iteration. If you, if you don't keep that backlog groomed, the developers can't do their job. Okay. Now, you believe that after your session, attendees will be able to take back to their team new ways to plan for a well-groomed backlog. And as cited in your presentation summary, a well-groomed backlog is something you feel everyone's project and team deserves. Is it cruel and unusual punishment <laughs> in this day and age to force a team to succumb to backlog chaos? Absolutely it is. Uh, not getting requirements right has been the cause of, of chaos in software development for forever. And that's still true with Agile techniques. Um, we talk in Agile about embracing change but that's different from requirements churn, where, where, where you're constantly changing what, what's demanded because you hadn't thought it out well in the first place. And that churn is a productivity killer. Unlike the, the change that we know how to manage in Agile, you don't want, you don't want to, to keep changing because you haven't figured out what you're trying to do. So you can't just say it's up to the product owner to get it right. Um, Bob Gale, in, in, in some recent conferences, has talked about it taking a village to keep, and, and discipline to keep the backlog groomed. Requirements have to meet the definition of ready, ready to be turned into working code, and it's not fair to hold a team of great developers hostage to an undisciplined backlog. Okay, so it definitely is cruel and unusual punishment. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, so as one can imagine, getting your backlog ready you know, really takes a lot of work and planning. Uh, but you've also narrowed down five key issues to consider in planning that will help set up for the project for success. Can you share at least one of these keys with us? Sure. Let's talk about keeping two views of the backlog. Uh, classically in Agile methods, and isn't it amazing that we can now talk about classically in Agile methods? Right. Um, the, the backlog's a priority, prioritized list of user stories. It's a flat list. 
of the stories in the priority order so that the ones on the top can get pulled off for the next iteration. And that back backlog gets reprioritized iteration by iteration. But as iterations have become shorter and shorter, um, you have to make sure that those top stories that are being pulled off for the next iteration are broken down into developer-sized bytes, small enough stories that they can be developed within one iteration. Those small stories probably started off as parts of larger stories that you've broken down, stories, epics, or features, whatever terms you want to use, um, that you've broken down into the smaller stories that can be developed in each particular iteration. But those, those details, therefore, are not just um, part of that flat list, but they're part of a hierarchy of features. And so to the, that hierarchy is what gives those developer-sized bytes the meaning and the context to the business, and that's what lets the business know what creates value to the business. So it's important to keep that hierarchical view in addition to the list of, of prioritized stories. There, there are several techniques that we see in the Agile literature for doing this. There's a notion Jeff Patton introduced called user story maps. Um, there's the notion of minimal marketable features. You can use traditional requirements hierarchies. It doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter too much how you do it. However you do it, while you're grooming the backlog, you have to track both that prioritized list of stories, but also that hierarchical view that shows the value to the business. And, and lets the business know that they're developing the, the, the right software. You know, that, that's really great. And, you know, the reality, I, I've never even thought about looking at those two views. So that, that's really interesting. I look forward that's, to... It's really two views of the same content. Yeah, I look forward to seeing the other four, view, uh, the other four keys in the presentation. So moving on along here, how does the application of metrics fit into Groom in the backlog? Well, metrics is you know, QSM's business. And how grooming the backlog progresses during the course of the project has some immediate consequences. If the backlog's not groomed, then there are no stories to develop in the next iteration. Those are fairly easy to see, but not grooming the backlog well enough can also have consequences down the road, and you need an early heads up on those down the road consequences. In the talk we'll be giving at Agile East, we describe three metrics in a milestone. Um, we'll show how, how those, those metrics will help you see early whether the work is progressing according to plan. So in QSM Slim Control, for example, when you track values of a metric, you not only see the actuals uh, up, to, up to that point in the shape of the curve of the actuals, we've all looked at, at burn down charts and seen whether, we're, whether the shape of the burn down chart is right, but you also compare that shape to, to what you expected based on your plan. And you can evaluate the variation between um, what, what you're actually doing in your plan, and of course there's variation. Things never go exactly to plan. Sometimes you're ahead, sometimes you're a little bit behind. But you can see whether that variation's within expected control bounds and you're doing just fine. Or is that variation showing you that you're falling way behind um, long term? And that, that, that gives you an early head start to realize there's some corrective action you can take maybe to get back on plan or maybe you actually have to reforecast re the, the project. But without keeping those metrics, you can't get that early head start. You only see the consequences when it's a little too late to react to them. All right, so metrics kind of help to be proactive instead of reactive. Absolutely. Fantastic. Now, you also spoken before on software tools and methods with emphasis on making sure that tools serve the team and not the other way around. Right. And when I first read that, I have to admit, embarrassingly, I kind of first thought about Blade Runner and some of the other sci-fi movies <laughs> out there. So it's, you know, while a very humorous notion, unfortunately, you know, it is also true more times than it should be. So how can team members make sure that they're in control of the process and not the tools in control of them? Yeah, so that, that, that's tricky because you're introducing a tool in order to change and improve your process, right? That, that, that's the reason you're introducing a new tool. And um, you can't, so you can't just expect to use the new tool and work exactly the way you were currently working because then you're not going to get the improvement you want. And you also want to be sure you never fight the tool. But you want to be sure that you're still in control and that the tool's serving you and not the other way around. So the, the, both the process and the tool have to be some flexible. So with all that in mind, here's, here's a few guidelines you can think about. First, on the process side, you want to make sure that you understand the goals of your process. You're not just doing things because that's how we've always done them, but you're doing things for a reason, and, you, and it's that reason that you want to maintain when, when you're introducing the new tool, and you want to be able to do that better. When you're evaluating the tool, 
also evaluate how the vendor approaches this very issue. Do they, do they try to understand what you're trying to accomplish and, and then help you see how their tool will help you do that? Or do they just show you, here's how our tool works and take it or leave it? Right, um, right. When you're looking at, at, at comparing tools, make sure that any tools that you bring into your environment are highly configurable. You don't want a, a tool to, to, do, to work just one way and that's the way that you have to use it. You want to be confident you won't be boxed in too much by the tool, even though in many cases you probably will start with some out-of-the-box configuration, but you want to make sure that it can grow. And you also want to make sure somebody on your team is trained in doing that kind of configuration, because nobody understands better what your team's trying to accomplish than people on your own team. Exactly. Yep. And event, you know, inevitably, though, you are going to need some help from the vendor. Tools are complicated to use, and processes are complicated, and you're going to try to figure out, how can I make this tool do what I want it to do? When you're asking for help from the vendor, make sure, again, you focus on what you're trying to accomplish, not just the little stumbling block you ran into in configuration, because that way the vendor's going to find the best way to, to meet your needs, and it might be going down a whole different road than what you were, what you were trying to do. So whether it's your team or the vendor, make sure that you always start with the question, what do we want to accomplish with this process? And then look at how does this tool help us do that? And of course, you know, like you said earlier, avoid those famous last words of, well, this is how we've always done it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> right. Do you know the term QWERTY phenomenon? Excuse me? Have you ever heard the term QWERTY phenomenon? I have not. It's the, the, the keys on a keyboard. Right. You know, that the, the layout of the keys on our keyboard are that way because that's how it's always, always been. There you go. Yeah. All right. So in addition to you know speaking, you're also a writer and you've written several articles on the importance of setting realistic expectations during the planning stage. Right. Uh, do you think a lot of projects are consistently failing to meet expectations, whether those expectations are fair or not? Yeah, unfortunately, our experiences at QSM show that that's still the case in software development. And your qualification, whether fair or not, is a really good one. Um, often the expectations that are put on a project never even had a chance to be, to be met. There are too many projects that are chartered based on just on wishful thinking. Uh, you, you know the scenario, an executive says, and you can get all this done in four months, right? right. <laughs> and because many companies still don't keep history of the work that they've completed, Nobody has the nerve to say, no, we can't do that, because you don't have any way of proving that you can't. In the field of software estimation, we talk about the impossible zone. That's where somebody has some expectations about the cost or the schedule of a project that not only is a stretch, but it's never been achieved by any comparable project anywhere. And too often, projects are chartered in the impossible zone. QSM has a database of thousands of completed projects. Um, we, 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 our, our customers um, share, and we, an we anonymously, um, the data on their completed projects. So we have very good um, industry-wide data. We believe that when you're chartering a new project, either use your own history, which is best, but if you don't have it, you can use our industry-wide data to set realistic expectations based on what's done before. There's nothing wrong with asking uh, your teams to stretch. There's nothing wrong with expecting improvement. And, and, and those may or may not succeed to, to some, some degree. But if you expect the impossible, you're bound to be disappointed. Okay. And that kind of ties back in earlier about metrics being helping to be proactive versus reactive and being predictive. Absolutely. Absolutely. The reason for, for collecting those metrics is to take some action with them. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Now, getting away for, from software for a second, and I see the picture in the background there. Uh, you foster retired racing greyhounds in an yeah. effort to help them transition into becoming household pets. That's right. How, how did you get started doing such a noble act? Uh, about, thanks for asking. About 10 years ago, uh, we were in a pet store to get some food for the cat that we had at the time. And one of the local greyhound adoption groups had what we call meets and greets, where they have four or five greyhounds that are, are, are at the pet store. Um, and they're there to introduce people who haven't met greyhounds before to the breed. Everybody thinks greyhounds are running around all the time. And actually, they're the most gentle, sweetest dogs that you've ever met. And we totally fell in love with the breed. And after adopting our own girl and seeing how much we gained from having her in our home, we felt it, we needed to give back to the group and help foster others so that other uh, adoptees can have the same experience we had. There are greyhound adoption groups all over the country. And, and, and I... I'd really suggest uh, your your users, uh, your listeners, uh, check check those out. And there's even a very active worldwide community of greyhound lovers on Facebook. Fantastic. So is that yours uh, behind in the picture? 
It it is. She's she's the girl that we the first girl that Rayhan girl that we got. All right, fantastic. All right. Uh, now, is there anything you'd like to say to the delegates of Agile Development and Better Software East before they attend the conference? Sure. Um, Agile methodologies are ma matured enough that the question now is not is Agile a good idea, but it's really how can we adopt and improve our use of Agile techniques. And the Agile Development and Better Software East conference is going to be a great place to learn both basic principles and practical applications, whether you're new to Agile, whether you're experienced, or whether you're an expert. Um, as I said when we talked about tools following process, when, when, you're, when, you're at the, when you're at the conference, focus on what are you trying to accomplish with your Agile methods and how will this help us accomplish it and, and listen to the talks with, with that in mind. Software development's hard and the conference is going to be a great venue to learn and take back techniques that are going to help you do that hard work some better. And while you're at the conference, please stop by the QSM booth at the Expo. We'd really love to meet you. All right, fantastic. Once again, this was Andy Berner of QSM, and he's given a presentation titled Grooming the Backlog, Plan the Work, Work the Plan. Make sure to check it out and meet with him there at the conference. Thanks so much, Andy. Thank you very much.